Hey internet, another just standing here talking in my iPhone video, but hopefully we're gonna have some interesting facts and it's not gonna be like standing listening to Professor Tweed Pants talk to you about Rhodactylus, although that's a gecko. But either way, we're gonna talk today about common snake myths and misconceptions. Today we're gonna... <laughs> Common snake myths and misconceptions. So these are things that are in kind of folklore, things floating around the internet, and things that we just kind of learn to associate with snakes just because we didn't know any better, like wolves howling at the moon. And on howl at the moon, people were just out during a full moon and, and wolves howl, so they associated it with it. But so the first common misconception, this isn't so much a myth, but it's a misconception about snakes. Every single person who has a snake or a reptile is asked this question whenever they talk about it. And it's, do you have any poisonous ones? So in a previous video, we talked about the only species of poisonous snake. That's the tiger killback. So what they're actually meaning is, do you have any venomous snakes? And for whatever reason, even in academic literature, the term poison and venom are always misconstrued. The easiest way to break it down is if I eats it, I dies. Or if I bites it, I dies. That is poisonous. If it, if it bites me, I dies. That's venom. So venom has to be actively put into your system. Essentially, it's all about the delivery system. So if an animal has a fang or a barb or a stinger that actively puts in this adapted protein that is venom, that's venomous. So a Gila monster, a lionfish, a king cobra, a lionfish, a scorpion, any spider, those are all venomous. Poison has to be passively ingested. So a poison dart frog or a puffer fish, those aren't venomous. You have to actually ingest them and then your body absorbs that, that is poisonous. And that's just kind of the biggest thing that always gets thrown around is venom versus poison. Next up, this one is a myth. It's, and we've all heard it. Everyone has a friend or a cousin that they had a Burmese python that they let slither all over them. And one day they fell asleep. And when they woke up, their snake was stretched out all along the side of them and then when they went and talked to their vet about it because they thought it was weird, they went, the vet told them, oh, your snake is measuring you to see if it's, if you're able to be eaten by it or not. I don't know where this one came from or where, or where that popped out. I actually heard this while helping out someone in a retail store where an actual reptile person said that and was worried about getting a large snake because they said that they did that. And that kind of threw me for a loop a little bit. I was like, what? No, no, you're, no, I don't understand where that came from. So what I think, so what happens is, is the snake who is out in room temperature in most houses, their, their temps are in like, you know, the 60s and 70s. So that's really too cold for most snake species in general. They want to get warmer. And if they're just kind of out and about and you're the only warm thing next to it, it's going to come up to you for warmth. I can't think of any snake species out in the wild that, like in, in Africa, a rock python goes, oh, let's see, is this gazelle? Let me measure. No, no, they don't do that. They're, they're ambush opportunistic hunters. If something comes along, they're gonna they're gonna take a shot at it if they think they can do it. They don't need to get out a chart and graph and measure you to see if that's gonna happen. And I'm not really sure where that originally came from. I think it was just because people were doing that where they have the snake out in an unfriendly, basically hospital and hospitable envir inhospitable environment, and they're just trying to get warm with the only radiant heat source, and that's you. They're there's no such thing as a snake that's going to decide, okay, I'm nine feet long, you're five two. Yeah, I think it can work. It's just, it's not gonna happen. The next is 
uh, one that I'm actually somewhat guilty of saying as well, and that's that snakes are deaf. This one is a pretty obvious one that makes sense as to why people started saying that, and that's that snakes don't have any external ears. It's just solid skin all the way down. Other reptiles, like lizards, they have what's called an auditory meatus, where it's like behind, like in the back of the head, there's the holes that are like your regular ear canal, and that's where their ear is. So they can hear external, audible, carrying through the air sounds. Snakes do have ears, they're just entirely covered. So they can still hear, just not clearly at all. And what they've kind of, and what scientists have basically concluded is that it would be very similar to where if you just like tightly cupped your hands over your ears. You can still hear, but not hear very well, but they can definitely feel things like through vibration, but they just can't hear like through the air sounds. Next up, the myth that rattlesnakes always rattle before they strike. This one I've always heard, and I know it's in a lot of folklore, folklore that, and it's ingrained in a lot of people, but I can't think of any animal that takes direction from its butt before it does something. So the rattle was evolved to be a warning system to say, hey, I'm here. Not, this is it, this is like, are you, it's not like Clippy from old Microsoft Word where it's, do you wanna mess with me? Are you sure? No, the, the, the rattle is not Clippy. It's just another warning sign. It's another thing, it's a defense mechanism, kind of like a cobra has a hood. It's a last ditch effort. Most of the time, if a rattlesnake knows you're coming, it's gonna leave. That's the first response of any snake. It's, they're threatened, they're shy, they're very cryptic by nature. They wanna hide. But if you come up them and surprise them, then that's where the hood comes up on the cobra. That's when the rattle starts rattling. But it's never the case where they will rattle, then they will bite. Sometimes people have been bitten by rattlesnakes and they never once heard a rattle. So, you know, because they do it so often and because it's so iconic, we can see where that came from, but it's not the case that rattle first, then bite. Next is the myth that baby snakes are more dangerous or more venomous than the adults. So this one, there is a little bit of truth to it, but in all honesty, it's not. So number one, a baby snake is much smaller than an adult. So that means that the venom that they can produce is significantly less than an adult. So already off the bat, the amount that's gonna go if they do in fact bite you is significantly less. And then the second thing is that their toxin or whatever venom it is, regardless of the species, is predominantly the same from birth to death, where a baby, the venom is pretty much the same as an adult. In actuality, in, not, not actuality, but very recently, they have actually done a bit of a study to see that some of the, uh, the, the toxins do change a little bit in a couple different species of rattlesnake that they saw later in life. And so if anything, the older the animal gets, the more likely it is that the antivenom won't work as well than if it was a younger animal. The, the part that is a little bit in, in reality is that an older snake is had more time and more experience to kind of figure out, hey, this venom that I'm producing is kind of expensive to make. It's not infinite. I really should only use it when hunting because that's what the venom was evolved to do was to help and aid in hunting and eating. And so uh, you're more likely to receive a dry bite or a bite that doesn't have any or very limited amounts of venom from an adult older animal than a baby. A baby is much more timid, much more cryptic, much more likely to bite because it's so afraid it doesn't have as much experience as an older animal that you would be more likely to receive a full uh, a full envenomation from a baby than you would an adult, but to say that it's more venomous is actually inaccurate. So it's the same that the venom is the same, 
that they will probably deliver more venom per bite than an adult would, but the overall amount that the baby can even give would, is nothing compared to the amount that an adult could, specifically in larger species like Gaboon Vipers or large Western or Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnakes. This next one is probably the most common misconception or myth, and that's that snakes dislocate their jaws to eat their prey. This one, we can clearly see why people think that, even to this day, even among kind of the more, I don't want to say educated people, but more people that are aware about snakes in general, because it does kind of look like they're doing that. But what's, what's actually happening is their lower part of their jaw is very elastic. So if you look at a snake skull versus like a person's skull, they're very different and not just because it's a snake and a human being. If you look at my lower jaw, like if you look at an x-ray of my lower jaw, it's a solid piece. All of this is connecting. A snake actually has two separate pieces of their lower jaw where it sits like this and the top is a single piece. There's a very, very elastic muscle that connects the two lower jaws to when they eat that very large prey that's larger than their heads, that really elastic muscle will expand so that the bone doesn't actually dislocate or ever separate, it just spreads apart because they're not connected to in the first place. And even further down, sometimes if you ever watch your snakes, they'll sit there and kind of like readjust and move it around. That's them just kind of like adjusting it around. It's not them reconnecting the things. It's just kind of like, kind of stretching after like a big thing. They're just kind of getting things back to normal. So this next one is very, very common. And that is the myth that snakes hypnotize their prey and snake charmers can hypnotize the cobras. They're technically two different ones, but they kind of go along to the same thing. So when a snake when, when people say that a snake is hypnotizing their prey, sometimes while watching a snake hunt, they'll kind of key on on an animal. And when they make, when they visually look at the animal, the animal just kind of like holds still and then it gets grabbed. What's actually happening is that a very, very common response with all prey animals, mice to deer, is to freeze. So most of the time, the animals are trying to blend in the surroundings. That's why they have the coloration that they do is to blend in naturally in the environment that they're in. And so when they sense, smell, see, think there's a predator around, their very first natural instinct is just to freeze and not move. Because if they freeze and they don't move, maybe they'll try to blend in and the predator will move on. So that's what's actually happening is that the prey, the prey animal, mouse, rat, or whatever, you know, thinks that thinks or sees that there is a predator there. And so it freezes trying to stay still, hoping the predator loses interest. And unfortunately, they don't, well, not unfortunately, but that's the circle of life. It doesn't always. And that's when the snake will grab the prey item. When it comes to the snake charmer, it's, we've all seen the videos of the guy with the flute who sits there and does this and, and does the thing out of the cobra out of the basket. What that is, the cobra isn't being charmed by the music it's not being hypnotized it's just following the movement of the flute that's why they have that and so you know it's the when the cobra pops up and it puts up its hood that is a threat display because it is scared it's being cor it's cornered there's a big monster looking at it it's frightened and so that's what that hood comes up it says hey leave me alone but when that happens, it really cues in on any movement because that is the potential threat that what it is. And so when the snake charmer is sitting there moving the flute around, that's what's moving and that's what the cobra keys in on is the movement of the flute. Nothing's actually being hypnotized as much fun as that would in fact be. So this last myth is, nice voice crack, Jay-Z, is probably the most common one that we've all heard outside of like the rattlesnake thing and that's involving the coral snake and the king snake milk snakes we've all heard the the you know there's a little rhyme to determine whether or not it's a coral snake which is north america's only a lapid the venomous snake or a king snake or milk snake that looks just like it 
and you know we've all heard that red touch is yellow you're a dead fellow black uh, red touch is black friend of jack you're okay jack and what that's in terms is so that's that three color banding red yellow and black for what they were implying is that with coral snakes if it goes red touching the yellow and then a black and then red and yellow that's the venomous coral snake and then with king snake if red's touching black then it's the non-venomous colubrid the problem with that is that that's not always the case as we all know with our love of ball pythons and corn snakes there is a huge variety of color patterns and then if you get into more specifically with like localities of different animals you know that there's a big difference of pattern even in specific localities of just regular snakes outside of the crazy morph genetics and the reason why that's not a great way to determine whether or not it's a venomous snake or not is that there are some localities even here in the united states of coral snake where the yellow or the where the red will touch black and it's still a corn snake it not it <laughs> where the red touches black and it's still the venomous coral snake and as you move further south into central and south america where there are even more species of coral snakes that entirely goes out the window where there are some coral snakes that don't even have yellow on them they're just a striped red and black or orange and black so really there's no 100 percent foolproof way to say this is a coral snake this is a mill snake without actually knowing what the species is and i would never ever ever recommend going out and picking it up and trying to figure out what it is that being said a coral snake is probably the last venomous species of snake that will ever bite you but they also have stopped making a lot of anti-venom for coral snakes here in the united states so once again please still go out and pick up every tricolor snake that you see to figure out whether it's a scarlet king snake or an eastern coral snake hope you guys like this video i know it's another one of just me standing here and yapping at my iphone um I want to do more videos of going out and doing things and seeing facilities and talking to cool people, but everyone's busy. Someone who takes care of as many reptiles and animals as I do knows that it's really hard to have a really flexible schedule to meet up with people. So I'm going to do a lot of these and I'm going to try to change up the topic a little bit every now and again. So it's not just here's this ball python, here's this ball python, there's a calico, here's a now by now. It's going to be a little different and hoping keeping things are a little bit fresh and you guys find it entertaining or at least informative um if you have any suggestions if you have any ideas for content or helping out with the website that would be amazing um let me know down in the comments check out our instagram and facebook it's still jay-z reptiles just to keep it all the same um stay tuned for our updates on on there because we update a lot more frequently there we should have babies coming out soon. A couple people have asked about if we're having any babies coming out. We have a couple adults available right now, but meh. Um, please like and subscribe if you can. Hit that bell notification. Please share your passion with your friends, whether it's about animals or whatever you're interested in. Hope you guys have a good day, and I'll catch you next time.